now we will be discussing the main causes of cardiogenic shock cardio genic shock cardiogenic shock now as i told you in cardiogenic shock the main problem is that the heart is unable to produce enough cardiac output problem is not with the volume or the capacity now we have to see that why heart is unable to produce enough cardiac output right what could be the reason one reason could be like arrhythmias cardiogenic shock one causes that a arrhythmias and here the point which you have to remember is that arrhythmias e they are bradyarrhythmias arrhythmias or tachyarrhythmias both can lead to cardiogenic shock i will explain how arrhythmias which may be tachyarrhythmias tachyarrhythmias as well as severe bradyarrhythmias bradyarrhythmias now the question is that how tachyarrhythmia will lead to shock for example we talk about ventricular fibrillation first i have to make a very important concept clear when heart rate increases usually we say cardiac output is equal to heart rate into stroke volume is that right now normally when heart rate is increasing cardiac output is increasing but when heart rate goes beyond a certain limit when heart rate going start going beyond a certain limit cardiac output decreasing why because then stroke volume is dangerously going down the question is that when heart rate become really very high why is stroke volume dangerously reducing answer is when heart rate become very fa very very fast then naturally cardiac cycle time is reduced for example if i tell you that your heart rate is 220 is that right then how your cardiac output will be less let me explain for example your heart is beating at the rate of 72 beats per minute under these circumstances one cardiac cycle time is 0.8 second out of this 0.8 second 0.3 second is for systole and 0.5 second is for diastole is it clear now it is when your heart rate is pulse 72 and your cardiac cycle time is 0.8 second now you imagine your heart rate become three times more for example your heart rate is 216 if your heart rate is 216 ventricular beating is 216 it means cardiac cycle duration is 1/3 cardiac cycle duration will become One third. It is no more point eight second. How much it will become? Point two six second. For example, now you see cardiac cycle duration has been reduced significantly on at very heart rate. But out of this, the point which you have to remember is that major changes that systole. Out of point three second, maybe now point two second, and diastole, diastole, which was point five second, maybe point zero six second. Now, what did we learn? That when heart rate goes rapidly increasing, it is not the systolic time which rapidly reduces, but really reduces is diastolic time. Diastolic time is the ventricular filling time diastolic time is ventricular filling time so what really happens again let me explain that in the patients when heart rate start going up right beyond a certain limit for example around 180 beats per minute diastole start shrinking rapidly and diastole become diastolic time become so less that ventricle cannot fill if ventricle filling times are dangerously reduced can we maintain the stroke volume So even if heart rate is very high, stroke volume is too low, and when stroke volume is too low, cardiac output drops. Now let me give you an example. That let's suppose if I say your heart rate is very fast, it is two hundred, 
and stroke volume is only 10. Then total cardiac output is 2000. But normally you have 72 heart rate and about 70 ml is stroke volume and it becomes 5000 ml or you can say 5 liter. Now it means person with 72 beats per minute and stroke volume of 70 is having cardiac output of 5 liter. But the same person when heart rate goes very very fast, right, heart rate has gone very very rapid fast like 200 and stroke volume has dangerously dropped from 70 to 10 then increase in the heart rate is not as much as much there is a dangerous precipitous fall in the stroke volume. So in the end cardiac output is dangerously low and this person will go into cardiogenic shock. So from today onward you have to remember one thing when heart rate start increasing initially heart rate is increasing but stroke volume is not significantly affected. So cardiac output keep on increasing. But when heart rate becomes so fast, the diastolic time becomes so less that uh, ventricular filling is dangerously impaired and stroke volume dangerously start falling, then naturally it further increase in the heart rate will be associated with decreasing cardiac output, not increasing cardiac output. And if heart rate is really too fast, then heart will not pump well and you will end up with cardiogenic shock. The classical example here I would like to give is ventricular arrhythmias. You know in ventricular arrhythmia what is the cardiac output? Answer is zero. Because when ventricular, sorry, especially ventricular, I mean fibrillation, correct it. In case of ventricular fibrillation, right. In case of ventricular fibrillation, electrical activity of ventricle may be 400, right, per minute. But heart is beating electrically so fast that mechanically heart cannot work and cardiac output drop to zero. So in ventricular fibrillation patient may be pulseless and BP less. So when patient become pulseless and BP less of course if you don't defibrillate him rapidly uh, he is going to die. So what I am going to say that again let me repeat it that tachyarrhythmias can produce cardiogenic shock but you have to remember that slight tachycardias actually increases cardiac output but when tachycardia become very fast and diastolic time rapidly reduces and you undergo cardiogenic shock. Is that clear? Now we come to bradyarrhythmia. It is easy to understand. The severe bradyarrhythmia why they will take to the you can say cardiac failure or cardiogenic shock. Again let me repeat it the cardiac output is equal to heart rate into stroke volume. Is that right? Now cardiac output if someone has heart rate of only 10 and even if stroke volume is normal like 70, 700 ml is extremely low cardiac output. Normally cardiac output is around 5000. So this is a, a calculation which is showing that in severe Brady arrhythmias in spite of the fact that even if stroke volume is maintained well, you will have dangerously low cardiac output and you will go into what problem? Cardiogenic shock. So arrhythmias, very severe tachyarrhythmias or very severe bradyarrhythmias, both of them can precipitate cardiogenic shock by reducing the cardiac output dangerously low, right. Then we can come to true pump failure, right, that in the heart problem is not with the rhythm. This was cardiogenic shock due to rhythm problem. Now we are going to talk about cardiogenic shock which is truly due to pump failure. Pump failure, right. The classical example of this is massive myocardial infarction, massive myocardial infarction, massive myocardial infarction. When there is massive myocardial infarction, let us suppose this much area of the myocardium is infarcted, right, and it is not contracting. Can heart maintain cardiac output? Because stroke volume will be dangerously low and again patient will go into cardiogenic shock, right. Pump failure may be massive myocardial infarction. Sometimes pump failure may be due to severe type of cardiomyopathies, cardio myopathies. For example, dilating cardiomyopathy. In dilating cardiomyopathy, what really happens that myocardium is 
left ventricle is dangerously dilated. And if left ventricle is too much dilated, right, then it cannot maintain the cardiac output. Let me explain why. If left ventricle is too much dilated, is that right? Now, why cardiac output cannot be maintained? Because the pressure which is generated, pressure which is generated to push the blood out, the pressure which is generated to uh, uh, produce a stroke volume, right, is equal to roughly tension by radius. I have omitted some part of the equation, but pressure is directly proportional to the tension in the wall, the tension which is produced in the wall and the radius. Now, what really happens? that in a very much dilated heart, right, that whatever tension heart can produce because radius is too big, so it cannot produce the pressure. Let me tell you one simple example that let's suppose normal heart is producing pressure of 120 or pressure of 100 millimeter of mercury, right, and radius is 5 centimeter square, right, and maybe then tension is how much? It is 5 100 units. So 500 units of tension divided by 5 centimeter is 100 unit of pressure. Now you imagine that tension is same but it has dilated and if it has dilated now it is supposed 10 centimeter. If it is 10 centimeter the pressure generated are very very less. These pressures are not enough to maintain enough cardiac output and that will translate into what? That will translate into cardiogenic shock. So what I'm trying to explain here that there may be severe rhythm problems, tachyarrhythmia sphere or bradyarrhythmia sphere, both will end up into cardiogenic shock. Or there's pump problem, either there's very much dilated heart or there is a non-kinetic, you can say hypokinetic heart, hypokinetic heart means heart is not contracting well. For example, in massive MI, you will end up with the cardiogenic shock. Then another condition is, which can lead to cardiogenic shock is, Severe valvular failure. Severe valvular, for example, regurgitation. Severe valvular dysfunction, especially regurgitation. Severe valvular dysfunction. For example, we talk about valvular regurgitation. Again, one of the simple example that if there is valve become acutely regurgitant, if valve becomes acutely regurgitant, right, cardiac output cannot be maintained. Let's talk about mitral valve. That here is mitral valve and here are corda tendony and here are muscle papillary muscles. Now what really happens? that if there is, and suppose, if there is infective endocarditis here and infective vegetation destroy the valve, there will be very severe regurgitation. So whenever left ventricle will contract, right, rather than producing stroke volume towards the aorta, lot of blood will be regurgitating in reverse direction into atrium, right, number one. Number two. Or another example is that let's suppose there is rupture of papillary muscle. In some patient with myocardial infarction, if papillary muscle is also damaged, there may be rupture of papillary muscle. And if there is rupture of papillary muscle, right, then papillary muscle of course lose their function and whenever left ventricle contract, uh, it will be leading to very strong regurgitant current to the atrium. So it cannot maintain its stroke volume and cardiac output and that may lead to cardiogenic shock. So cardiogenic shock can be produced by very severe valvular lien like mitral valve regurgitation or aortic valve regurgitation. Regurgitating lions are more prone to produce cardiogenic shock than the stenotic lions. Then one of the very simple example, cardiogenic shock, when there is rupture of free wall of the left ventricle or when there is rupture of cardiac septum. Let's suppose here is your heart and this area is infarcted. This area is infarcted. Of course, here is your pericardium. 
Now, what really happens that on third or around the third day of the myocardial infarction, lot of neutrophils and macrophages are active within the infarcted tissue. And sometimes these neutrophils and macrophages produce so much proteolytic and destructive enzymes that myocardial tissue may be very weak and during a strong systole it may rupture. And if it ruptures, it will throw a lot of blood into which cavity? Pericardial cavity, right? And of course, it is no more a effective pump. And the blood which is coming into pericardial cavity, right, you can say there will be hemopericardium and this pericardium when it becomes full, it will squeeze the heart and heart will lose its function and you will go into severe cardiogenic failure. Is that right? Or yes, septum. In some infarction, septum is also involved and if septal wall ruptures, whenever left ventricle will produce the tension to produce the pressure, lot of you can say blood will be, effort of the left ventricle will be lost as blood is moving from left to right. Am I clear? So we can say that rupture of ventricular septum or the free wall, rupture of, rupture of ventricular septum or free wall that will also lead to failure of the ventricle to work, right? That may lead to cardiogenic shock. 